the nonprofit MBA purpose is to provide new business insights and fresh creative ideas for executive directors and their teams that will help them improve their organization. Here is your host, Stephen Halasnik. Welcome, everyone. My name is Stephen Halasnik, and I will be your host for today's Nonprofit MBA podcast. And for those of you who don't know me, I am co-founder of Financing Solutions. And for the last 13 years, Financing Solutions has been the number one leading provider. We're the largest provider of lines of credit for small nonprofits in the United States. And, you know, line of credits are very, very valuable. It's a, it is a very good product that people just love. It helps with evening out cash flow. That's usually the main purpose. So when you have expenses that need to be paid, they get paid like payroll. (laughs) So if you're interested in learning more, please visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Today, I am very excited to be speaking with Maria Bryan from Maria Bryan Creative. And Maria Bryan is a trauma-informed storytelling trainer she helps nonprofit leaders tell powerful and impact stories that resist harm. Maria has over 15 years in marketing communications in the public sector. She has a master's degree in public administrations and a bachelor's degree in journalism and is professionally certified in trauma and resilience, trauma informed space holding, and uh, somatic embodiment and regulation. Maria is a firm believer that storytelling makes the world a healthier, safer, cleaner, and happier place. Um, And today we're going to be talking about how trauma-informed storytelling helps nonprofits. And uh, Maria, welcome to today's uh, Nonprofit MBA podcast. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's a joy to be here. So, uh, you know, I, I, this is the sixth year of this podcast and, you know, since I've been doing, um, well, since I've been in this industry in general, uh, storytelling has always been a big part of nonprofits communication strategy, hasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not going anywhere. I firmly believe that stories have the power to change hearts and minds. And it's the catalyst for the change that we're all striving for in nonprofits. So yeah, I'm, I, I'm here for the storytellers. I'm, I'm a strong advocate of telling powerful nonprofit stories. Do, do you think that uh, nonprofits have forgotten how important storytelling is? Or have they, is it just old hack already? In other words, is they, everybody knows it. You know, I actually think that now more than ever, nonprofits are embracing storytelling and are doing the work of finding really powerful nonprofit stories, actually to the extent where experts like me are saying, yes, thank you for telling these powerful stories. They're really important, but how can we do so in a way that's trauma informed? And ethical. <laughs> and so the last thing I want is for folks to feel like, oh, let's not tell stories because they can be harmful. Um, but really, uh, nonprofits are truly embracing storytelling. They're seeing the ROI of it. And kind of the next stage is doing due diligence and, and, and respecting and dignifying um, story owners. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you're going to kick butt anyway. So um I want you to think about a client that you've worked with and um, they they're new and they come to you and tell me the story that they originally either did or came to you with and the way they articulated it first and then tell me how you changed it to make it trauma inspired, you know, uh, you know, you know, um, yeah, trauma informed. Yeah, trauma informed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, typical story. Um, you know, they'll give me this uh, annual appeal. Let's say at the end of the year when you're raising money at the most important giving season, just November and December. And the story is this: um, we are a homeless shelter for women, and Jane came to us. Um, she's a single mom. And she's experienced domestic violence. And 
Um, much of the story goes into how difficult and challenging and painful her life is. Um, and, and it kind of really dives into the pain for much of the story. And the story closes with, um, we provide really crucial services for folks like Jane. If you give, you help women like Jane um, live better lives for themselves and their children. That's the typical story. This is how I would audit that story. Um, from a trauma-informed perspective, if Jane is telling this story the <laughs> during the season that she's come to your door, so there's no resolution, there's no transformation, she is living a very traumatic time. And so you are asking her to share when she doesn't may not, she might have consent or think that she has consent, um, but might not even know the gravity of the trauma that she is experiencing and may feel like three months from now, a year from now, regret that she shared that story. So that's one reason to say, let's wait till Jane has, um, is out of our shelter system and is already in her brighter future as a start, right? Let's get in the habit of finding folks that, um, have had that transformation. Um, so not only is that telling a really great story, this story of transformation, but it's allowing time of healing. Okay, so that's number one. Two, we have choices on how we talk about pain in this story. The majority of this story is about overcoming pain and challenges. What I like is it's centered around Jane. It's not centered around you know, the, the nonprofit itself. I love that agency. And I don't think we should skirt around how painful and challenging this experience is. But that storyteller could have chose to start the story with this pain, but then really kind of given more um, context and data to this problem for folks to understand the nuance of the issue. Um, talk about some of the inspiring parts of her journey, even if they're little micro um, experiences. Like maybe for the first time as a parent, she really felt safe and listened to and cared for, or she had this really meaningful experience with her and her daughter um, here. So it doesn't have to be this huge um, transformation, just these little transformations. So that's two is saying, you know, why don't we talk about the pain, um, but we don't have to go necessarily into all the details. Let's spend some of that story, much of that story of the middle, talking about the transformation, still the challenges, but, but you know, some of those um, uh, positive, inspiring parts of her story. The last thing that I would say to her is when you are telling the story of someone who is currently your client, your call to action is going to evoke what? Saviorism. You donate, you will help Jane directly. Um, and I think there's ways to evoke empathy and inspiration and wanting to be part of this movement and cause instead of saviorism. So I think how they could have done that differently is shown that that transformation that Jane has experienced, how her life is now, paint the picture of the bright future she has ahead of her. And then the call to action is not help Jane, but if you support our organization, you are gonna support more women like Jane. You see that difference there? So there's a few things that you can do that are both trauma informed. That means that you are resisting harm and talking to Jane, but also they're ethical. They're really honoring and respecting those who have these really difficult life experiences. How much of a decision should you make um, of really going, like, let's use Jane as an example. Right. Um, let's say she is out of, um, the shelter or, or, or the, the, um, the help that she's getting. And you even, you know, of course you go to her and you say, Jane, you know, can you help us with this video testimonial or whatever, you know, the storytelling, um, how much should you rest it upon Jane's decision, even though she's an adult? Um, I, I mean, I'm thinking, yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of think like I've been, I right. recently went through two years ago, a very uh, traumatic experience and it, it made me think just now, um, okay, should, if people ask me about it, I'm very 
blunt about what had happened? Does it make me relive it over and over again? Uh, yes. Do I offer it all the time? Yes. Um, I don't suffer from talking about it. Um, but I, you know, actually there's another thing that happened that was traumatic after that, that wasn't as traumatic, but that caused me very um, traumatic stuff to repeat the story. And I actually recently just said, you know what, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. So you, you know my drift on this, right? So I absolutely do. First of all, thank you for being vulnerable with your own life experiences. And there's, this is a loaded, the best kind of loaded question, because first of all, you don't want Jane to feel like she won't be able to continue services if she doesn't tell her story, right? That's the worst case. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't even think of that, but yeah, you're right. 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 Yeah. So what are some ways that you can ensure what I call story readiness? And here's the thing about trauma-informed storytelling is it's not black and white, and I can't give you a checklist. You know, what we are doing is resisting harm. We cannot promise to do no harm. And we can promote safety, but we cannot promise safety. But here are some things that you can do. Instead of just saying, Jane, can you can we sit down with you to tell your story? Um, it'll go into this annual appeal. Say, hey, you have this really powerful story. And then follow up with a few questions like, um, this might bring up some things for you. You know, trauma is your body's, it's not the event itself. It's your body's response to the event. So asking questions like, do you feel like you have support people in your life when you tell this story? And that could be uh, a partner. It could be social workers. It could be a group therapist. It could be friends, family, but extending, you know, having them think through, do they have a support person if they have a re-traumatization um, asking them if they feel like they are emotionally, um, have they have the capacity to tell their story and just say like, you know, this is something that changes. Maybe you have the capacity today and you won't tomorrow um, and vice versa. So just allowing them to really reflect on whether or not they currently have capacity. And you gave a really good example of having capacity and then not having capacity. And like we all have agency and consent on when we do or do not um, have capacity. And the bigger part of your question is, do we let them make that choice for themselves? Yes. And um, are there people in the organization who have this background? Um, maybe social workers that have a trauma-informed background that you can go to them and say, from your perspective, are there folks in our organization or our alum from organization that you think are healed and excited and ready to tell their story? So you have this first line that can help you identify so that you're not necessarily going to someone um, without any context of if they are um, emotionally ready or not. So we, yeah, want that's, that's right. where I would, that's where I would have gone. Yeah. I think you're right. I think I uh, would have went to the, uh, you know, some of my organization mm -hmm. in or out and talked to them about this. So, right. you know, right. Yeah. And so I, I just, so, and this is what's so interesting about your question and something that I do struggle with is um, we really, one of the biggest principles of trauma-informed care is having choice and agency, right? So you do want them to have that choice and agency. And also people ask me, um, do we water down our stories so our audiences don't become re-traumatized? Re and that's a whole nother conversation. Happy to kind of get into our audience's trauma. Um, but I also in there think we need to give them choice on whether or not they want to engage this with our story. What What's our responsibility is to give the content warning, to give a heads up that this could be a very difficult story for them to consume and not make that choice for them. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, so um, how has story chain, storytelling changed over the last 10 years uh, in regards to this? Um, what, like 10 years ago, was it even a consideration that can be considered to, to watch out for the yeah. trauma that's involved? You know, you just think back to the 80s and the 90s and even the early aughts of these um, huge video campaigns where, you know, you have... Um, and I think Save the Children is is one of them, um, where they would go into these, um, you know, impoverished places and, and tell really sad stories and really give them no voice or no agency. Looks like there's kids with flies around them and 
there's no parents, but the parents could easily be off screen. And then the call to action being something like for the, you could save a life for a cup of a, you know, cost of a cup of coffee. Um, and so really we were taught that if it bleeds, it leads and to find pain points and really twist the knife. And what happened was on a large scale, uh, organizations were raising a lot of money with this, what we call at the time, you know, poverty porn, right? Um, so we have come, and I think that um, ethical storytellers have really paved the way before trauma-informed storytellers have come through to say, you know, we need to bring these story owners um, into this process and really allow for them to tell their own stories and not us just telling stories from their perspective. I think that's the biggest change. I think a slight change, which I think is also really, really important is our stories have always made nonprofits the main character. And I'm thrilled that we're changing that. And they go hand in hand where the main characters are um, the people we serve um, and not the, the nonprofits. So over the past 10, 15 years, I do think we've done a lot of work on respecting and dignifying, um, the people we serve, being more intentional about the stories we tell. I specifically work in trauma informed storytelling. So that is how can we create safer spaces for people who've experienced trauma to, um, tell their story and share their story and have those stories shared more widely. This is very, very new, um, this concept of taking, because the trauma-informed space in of itself is really not very old either. So all of those principles that social workers are using directly with folks who've experienced trauma and connecting the dots with what that means for the storytelling process um, is, is very, very new. The, um, when, you, when clients come to you, um, why, why do they come to you? They come to me because they are aware that there's the people they serve have experienced trauma and pain. And they also are aware that story telling their stories is important for fundraising and marketing. And they're really having a hard time reconciling those two. And you can reconcile those two. Um, and they come to me because they want validation that this is the case, and it is. And they want tools and processes and workflows in place that just help to support a storytelling process that does that that does just that. Anything from having consent in place, knowing if someone is ready to tell their story, what's a safe interview process look like, what is a um, ethical and trauma-informed review process. What happens when the story is out there and they decide that they want the story retracted? What's the process there? What happens when harm does take place? What do we do? What do we do to repair that harm? So from the very beginning to the very end of the storytelling process, they just need um, the tools um, to guide them. Again, there's nothing black and white, but there is, you know, trauma-informed guidance and tools that that I provide. I have to smile a little bit. That's not the right word. Uh, I was going to say laugh, and it's not going to be a... Pr uh, <laughs> but I can imagine you seeing something on TV or reading something, and you, <laughs> you get all angry because you see that they're exploiting uh, a person uh, through their messaging. And because, you know, this right. is what you do. You do, right, you, you right, don't right. do that. You know, you, you're, you're, you're being uh, cognizant of people's issues. Uh, is that happen a lot? So here is my off brand, huge secret, Stephen. I am the biggest true crime, like watch, like since I was a child, it was like uh -huh. America's most wanted. Right. And then this is what I watch to go to sleep at night is just trauma, like so much trauma. It's for some reason what I'm drawn to. And I know in 2024, a, a lot of folks are, are drawn to it. And there has been a difference between watching, um, you know, documentaries or listening to true, true um, crime podcasts a few years ago and now and feeling like they are not ready to tell their story or, oh, wow, they're doing that really, really well. Like the content warnings are on point and how they're talking about them is on point. So 
daily I am consuming true crime um, with that lens. And with um, because I mostly train nonprofit storytellers, although I do train um, journalists and videographers, other folks outside of the nonprofit um, sector, you know, I do, I do also will um, sometimes see stories and appeals that are incredibly upsetting. And I think the most upsetting to me are those direct appeals for if you donate now, you can help save the life of this specific person. I just find that so heartbreaking um, and problematic. So yeah, I do see things um, differently now. I think your answer is going to be no, but (laughs) have you ever seen a message that was so terrible that you reached out to that organization and you said, Hey, listen, this is bad. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess you'd be making a lot of phone calls, but. Oh my goodness. And that's, that's such an important question. And I'll say this, the values that lead my work are empathy, grace, and kindness. And I know unless you're ready for it, unless your heart is there and, and you're just ready to be challenged, it's it's not going to make a difference. And I, I have so much awe for folks that, that can do that, um, but it's just not what guides my work. I've even done trainings where people in the middle of my trainings have been like, this, this isn't for me. I'm just not there. I'm not um, ready. There, I have been tempted. There are some that I'm like, this is really, um, really harmful. Um, but I know having changed my mind and heart so many times that um, it can be um it can be a sl- just a slow process and not something that having a stranger <laughs> call you out is going to to make a big change. And to your point, I think one of the most difficult challenges is that folks that do come to me, they're the marketing managers, our marketing director, development managers, development director, and they're like, I feel this. This is my value, everything you're teaching me, but our leadership is not going to embrace this. They want us to tell these terrible traumatic stories. They want us to tell the stories of people who are here now and use their name and use their picture. Um, and I, I, Stephen, I don't have an answer for them. I, I, the best I can say is try your best to care for your nervous, care, your nervous system. And one day you will be that leader and be able to make um, those choices. So hang in there. What, uh, is there a certain framework that you can share with us that you see in a, a good story that's told well? Yes, I see a story that has that transformation arc, right? So from just a story perspective, um, you come in with this pain and challenge, but then you give the nuance and the context, right? So you bring in data, you bring in um, what the bigger picture is. And this really helps to not victim blame the story owner that you're telling. You're bringing in these bigger societal contexts that brought them to your door. And then the middle of this story does have this transformation, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have some challenges and some ups and downs. And we want our stories to be authentic and true. And the fact is not every client that comes through our doors has a perfectly clean ending, but to the best that we can, we tell stories of someone that is um, has some kind of transformation and has um, a brighter future. So what does that look like back end? And I'm kind of um, reiterating a few protocols, but that means that you're doing the work of um, holding hands with program staff and identifying people who are who are ready and abundantly willing to tell their story. You're getting consent from them and not just that media consent form, but like really, really having an in-depth conversation on the story and bringing them on that ride. So letting them see the interview questions beforehand, giving them a lot of choice on, do you want to meet in person to talk about this? Do you want to write it or videotape it and send it to me? Like what makes you most comfortable to share your story? When it comes to, again, the review process, bringing in a few folks to review. That's of course the story owner, that social worker or program staff, can they review the story? Um, for the really, really big stories, 
Um, you know, like sometimes once a year, that big story that you're telling on one person, that's going to be the gala video, right? Or, or the hero video of your website. That might be even more people. So not just the story owner, but other folks who have that same lived experience that are a little bit more removed that can kind of give some insight. So that review process is is really important. And then when it goes live, have this story retraction policy that's very easy for folks to say, hey, I don't want my story up any longer for whatever reason, no questions asked, so that you can really quickly make sure that you are taking that story down because their safety could be at risk. Something could be going on that that you're not aware of. So that's kind of like the back end and, and the front end of what I think is a is a trauma informed and ethical story. When when you've gone to maybe lecture on this or um, what is the reaction from the audience when you're starting to talk about this subject? Like more, maybe it's like a little bit right. more intimate setting right. where you can hear is 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 there is their reaction your audience like the executive directors or the director of communications um, fundraising executives, are they like, oh, I just never thought about this or mm-hmm. what, what, what's the reaction? Right. So it can be mixed. A lot of times people are first going to experience some shame and guilt looking back on their processes. I don't want that, but that is part of the you know process of learning something new. Because I talk a lot about vicarious trauma and actually storyteller self-care. That's a really important part of trauma-informed storytelling me is that we actually take care of ourselves in this process. In that, there's a lot of validation. Folks that are like, oh, you're right. I I am feeling like stress from gathering and telling these really um, painful stories. Um, And then oftentimes people are are eager to, to go on that journey and to learn more. And that's what I say. This is not a one-time thing that you just take a, you know, my course or program or listen to a webinar and you're trauma informed. It is, it is a process and a journey and something that takes a lot of grace and, and a lot of time. And of course, Stephen, I don't want to like make this all rainbows. There are some folks that are frustrated because their plate is full enough and they don't need, you know, like one, one more thing. But I'm very clear on what you're getting into. Typically, when someone's coming to listen to me, they know I'm going to be talking about trauma-informed storytelling. So they're kind of there with a little bit more of um open mind. Um yeah, I think that's probably a little bit. And and I'm I'm projecting because trauma-informed storytelling is um, fairly new to me too. It wasn't until 2022 that I actually was giving a very general um, nonprofit marketing webinar. And during the Q&A at the end, a student asked how trauma-informed um, storytelling works into my framework. And I absolutely hadn't heard of it before. I had no answer. And um, it, it changed my life. It completely changed my career and my consultancy. And so I went through that journey of shame and guilt, of learning, of validation, and of just committing to, um, to just do things better, but also honor that I'm human and imperfect. Yeah, I think just a, a side note, I think when I read the original topic for today, it's, it sounds terrible. I think I, yeah, I think I was going to say, okay, how can we make a better story out of someone's trauma experience, you know, so I can, so I can, my nonprofit can raise more money. Right. You know? Right. Um, and so now, you know, now I, I can see where you're opening people's minds and right. eyes and ears to the idea that, you know, maybe there needs to be a step back to understanding a little bit more how you're, you could be right. hurting somebody. So I get it. Well, here's the, here's the reality. There's a few, there's a few things, a few foundations here. One is there's just plenty of evidence to show most people have experienced trauma. You know, for the longest time we felt it was only something that war veterans experienced. And then we're like, no, there are other folks that experience extreme violence. Um, but now we know, again, trauma is a human response to feeling that you're in danger or that you are not safe. Um, and so most folks have, you've talked about experiencing trauma. I've experienced trauma in the context of nonprofits. We are solving some of the world's biggest problems. So of course 
there is trauma in that if we're solving really, really big societal problems. So I'm not going for the trauma. The trauma is there. And, you know, a lot of trauma informed experts are saying the pandemic is considered this historical trauma, right? So really all of us have been impacted by this historical drama of trauma of the pandemic. So there's no pretending that trauma doesn't exist. And so just how, how can we honor that? And again, I don't just talk about the trauma that our beneficiaries experience. I talk about the lived trauma and the secondary trauma that our audiences may experience while they're consuming our stories and the vicarious secondary and also lived trauma that storytellers may experience during the storytelling process. It doesn't just, it's not just about protecting the beneficiary. It's ways that we can kind of resist harm and promote safety for all involved in what I call the storytelling ecosystem. Yeah. And if you put that much effort into it, I bet you your story is going to be a lot better anyway. Right. Yes. I yes. Mean, okay, so go, yeah. Thank you for tying it back to that because I, I want to touch on those, those um, campaigns in the nineties that raised all that money. And here's the thing, they might have raised a lot of money, but they're not building relationships with their donors. There was a lot of one time don't, you know, donors. And so, yes, you're going to get good quality, beautiful, transformational stories but you're also building trust with your audience and your donors and your volunteers. So yes, you, you put in the work. It might be less stories that you're creating every year. Maybe you don't need to be writing 20 stories a year, or 50 stories a year. One of the first questions I asked in my trainings, how many stories do you create every year? And it's amazing how the goals people set for themselves. So maybe less stories, but yes, I agree. Um, if, if we're if we're doing this in a way that's trauma informed and ethical, it's going to it's going to have an impact, a really wonderful impact. Yeah, you know, I was talking a friend of one of my closest friends. Um, he's he's a brand um, consultant, and he I was talking to him about uh, the industry a little bit, and he had written a, a, a white paper about how um, how brands need to be a little bit more um, taking chances mm. and that, that they have gone in the reverse direction of being so strict. Right. And I can imagine that, that, that a nonprofit should have a communication strategy. That's a guideline. Um, and in part of that includes trauma inspired ethics that goes along with it as well. So that way, everything that's coming out has some guidelines on it so that they're consistent. It wouldn't be difficult to do, I don't think. No, uh, and we can still tell creative, impactful um, stories, stories that even, let's say, take risks Yeah. Um, while still being trauma-informed. Absolutely. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, it's all good stuff. Very interesting topic. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of these podcasts, almost two, over 200 now. And, uh, and you know, this this was really fascinating for me to learn. I didn't, something I didn't think about. Uh, it's all the time we have for today, but I'd like to thank so very much Maria Bryan from Maria and Bryan Creative for coming on today's podcast. And if you like today's podcast, please feel free to share it with a friend and also subscribe on your fav- favorite podcasting app. Uh, we have so many great guests like Maria that come on. And if you liked today's podcast or any of the other ones that we've done, please give us a five-star rating. Um, that helps us get the word out. And if you're looking for a line of credit for your nonprofit, please feel free to visit our website at nonprofitmbapodcast.com. Maria, if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would they go about doing that? You can go to my website, Maria Bryan. That's Brian with a Y. Um, dot com. And I have a podcast called When Bearing Witness, which explores all things trauma-informed storytelling. Cool. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Stephen. So um, I, I want to thank all of our listeners. Uh, thank you for listening, but I also want to thank you for trying to make the world a better place. Um, it is, um, there's a lot of problems in the world. There always has been, but there's always something more that we need to do. And you guys are out there uh, on the front line, uh, 
trying to make the world a better place. Thank you for doing that. But I just want to remind you that you're no good to your employees, your family, your friends, uh, nor yourself if you don't take care of yourself first. Because I know we have a lot of unselfish people out there and you're running a million miles an hour and solving world problems is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So we need you. So make sure that every morning or the night before you go to bed, you say, what am I going to do for myself tomorrow? Rather at be exercising, uh, you know, eating right, uh, meditating, dieting, whatever you think is bet not dieting, but you know, eating the right foods. Um, you know, just taking really good care or taking time out of the day just for you to regroup. All right. So thank you for always making a difference. Other than that, I want to wish everybody a great day and thank you for listening to the Nonprofit MBA podcast. The Nonprofit MBA purpose is to provide new business insights. And I hit the wrong button, but there it goes. <laughs>